why is climbing important to you specifically and what motivates you to continue growing as a climber? Um, well, climbing, I've, I've been climbing since 2006. Um, it's really brought a lot of direction to my life. Um, it's made me, you know, realize that taking care of my body is really important, eating healthy, um, you know, doing training and um, having a very strong mental um, framework to get through these problems. Um, so it's, it's just been the, the one thing that I got into that I never gave up on. It's, it's just, it never stops because you can go to different places and try different climbs and it, it's all very different. The geology is different. So it's awesome. I like what you said about, you know, that being something that you've never given up on and um, you've really focused. And I know Josh, who is our climbing tower lead, who's also on this call, had a question for you about kind of how you're doing that right now in this time. So I'm going to pass it over him, to him and he can ask his question. Sure, thank you. Um, so I was kind of wondering because it's different everywhere and I just wanted to see um, if you are able to still climb during the quarantine right now. and. If so, like, uh, is it like the same sort of climbing that you're doing as usual? Or if not, what are you doing to kind of sub in like a workout for that? Or what's the thing that you do at home? Right. Yeah, no, things have changed drastically. Um, I haven't been climbing outside as much because a lot of the places are on uh, state land. So those were all closed up until yesterday. So we were able to go to some that were on either private property or um federal uh, land so we did a, we were able to climb maybe once a week outside but um, otherwise you know it's training inside with the pull-up bars um, I've even started using doing some dumbbell workouts with just you know eight to ten pound weights um, just anything to kind of you know keep you uh, exercising really right because it's just sitting around at the house all day is yeah too much so, yeah, are you guys really doing things like that, pull-ups and push-ups and little challenges with each other? We've been trying. We also have, um, we work really closely with our fitness department. It's all kind of under our Rec and Wellness Center is outdoor adventure and fitness and a bunch of other areas. So we've been trying to partner with different areas. We have a yoga for climbers video that we put out on our Instagram and we've been trying to do more okay. fitness collaborations so that we can put it out to our climbers and tell them, hey, this is how you can, you know, stay active, stay healthy, stay in climbing shape during this time. Yeah. Great. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's a great segue also into something else I wanted to ask about. And you talked already about how Hawaii is such a tourist destination and a lot of people, you know, come there, not necessarily for the climbing, but um, as you yeah. said, it was getting a little overpopulated with some of the climbs. Um, are you seeing people sort of follow the guidelines that are put out by climbing organizations like the Arch Project? Oh, I, I'm seeing everyone being very respectful. Most of the climbing areas, um, have seen very, very little traffic. Um, everyone, yeah, has been doing a great job of staying at home and staying active at home and, you know, taking up new hobbies and um, new sports even, you know. Like, for me, I hate running, but I started running for some reason, so... <laughs> Yeah, now's the time, I think, to t test our abilities and test our willingness to try new things. And so it kind of comes Absolutely. back to that, um, just being thankful for this opportunity that we have and finding some, some goodness in it. So, Absolutely. Cool. Speaking of goodness, I am really curious, and I've had several people ask me about this too. Um, just I want to know everything about the climbing scene, um, where you are. Um, I'm even going to pass okay. it over to Brooke. She is one of our, our climbing team members and one of our leaders on the climbing team. And she has a pretty specific question, but in general, <laughs> we just want to know. Oh, hi, I'm Brooke. Um, I grew up in Waikiki, actually. Um, and my dad still lives in Honolulu. Um, so I go to visit him pretty frequently. And I've always wanted to climb outdoors when I'm there. And I never know, like, where to go or, like, how to start getting into the climbing team there. Do you have like any suggestions for like finding people to climb with or like what climbs are really good to start out with outdoors um, on Oahu? Yeah, um, I would suggest to most people that one of the best places is to go to um, the Arch Project Climbing Gym, which is in Waipio. It's kind of in the center of the island. 
So that's a great place to meet people once it reopens. I mean, right now it is closed. Um, uh, we have a climbing shop in downtown Honolulu. It's called uh, Climb Aloha, and they're very friendly. Yeah, they I think I've been there, actually. I remember seeing that. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, they actually, if you go into their shop and ask for um, a map of the Mokalaia wall, they'll give you a copy, and it'll show all the grades, how many bolts, and everything like that. So that's really mm -hmm. awesome. Um, if you're coming out with no pad, no gear, no nothing, Waimea Bay is the place to go. Um, you know, it, it gets pretty crowded there, so I recommend people going there earlier in the morning, uh, maybe parking on the street instead of in the parking garage, because that's crazy in there. But there's a lot of climbing at Waimea Bay. That's where I first started when I moved here. And I think there's probably like 20 climbs. And um, it's a little scary because, you know, it's about between 15 to 20 feet high, but mm -hmm. it's um, depending on the surf and time of year, there could be a lot of sand underneath you. Like I'm talking five feet of sand. So um, that that's pretty cool. I mean, <clears throat> you have to get used to having a lot of sand on your feet um, or on your climbing shoes, but it's, it's so much mm -hmm. fun. That's a great place. I totally recommend that. And um, boulderinghawaii.com also has some of the climbing areas um, because our access is a bit sensitive it doesn't have the exact location but um yeah once you you know come out and meet some of us then we'll be glad to share the locations with you awesome thanks so much for the suggestion no problem <laughs> can you maybe go into a little bit of why access is so sensitive with um climbing in hawaii Absolutely. Um, I think about five or six years ago, um, the YMCA, which is um, out near Mokalaia, the climbing wall I mentioned to you guys earlier, um, they, they took the kids out and one of the kids, um, like a loose rock hit her in the head. She sued this, her family sued the state. So the way the state dealt with it is they closed it down. They said, you just can't go up there. So they did that and some of the climbers from Climb Aloha and other uh, groups came together, uh, filed petitions, um, made new bills, basically taking that, um, I, I guess that potential for the state to get sued away um, so that, you know, if you're biking, climbing, hiking, you know, if you get injured on state land, you know, you can't sue the state. So that was the type of thing that we were trying to implement to give us some ability to go back up there. Um, and then most recently, last year in August, uh, or maybe October, they shut down an area in Maui, um, which I went and testified against. And so we're currently working on a management plan to try to reopen that area. I think just the, um, the government here is just not used to regulating something like rock climbing. Because um, a lot of the laws say, you know, you can't bolt and things like that because they consider that um, uh, defecti defecting, you know, geological features, so you can't do that. But once the bolts are up, um, it's okay to maintain it. So, you know, we've been trying to figure out what's okay and what's not okay and write a management plan so that we can keep these places open for the future. That's great. Well, um, what can the average person do to kind of assist that and to move that sort of legislation along? Well, um, right now for Mokalaia, for instance, if you do go out there, you know, we have a permit. You just uh, sign up one time and that's your permit forever. Um, so that's one way. Um, that takes the liability off the state. Um, you know, the practicing leave no trace, you know, um, not cutting down trees or hanging your gear on trees, picking up trash, even if it isn't yours. Uh, you see tape, you know, laying on the ground, you should definitely just pick it up and take it with you. Staying on the trails is really important. Um, we have a lot of sensitive, um, you know, ecosystems here, so that's also a concern. If places are closed down for cultural, historical reasons, you know, it's really important to respect those because if you don't respect those closures, they'll just close the whole area. 
Yeah, that's really important and something that we try and echo with our outdoor program here. Whenever we go on our outdoor trips, we always teach our participants leave no trace. And we also try and do beach cleanup trips as well that students can sign up for. So it's something that we really care about too. Awesome. Um, that's really great that you guys are doing that. Uh, I w the only thing I would add to that is um, we also, you know, want to educate everyone on safety, you know, how to spot, um, how to belay, all these things, because the safer we are, the less likely they're going to try to regulate us, you know, better uh, us to regulate each other and help each other out on how to be safe. Absolutely. That's super important, too. Um, can you talk a little bit about the ARCH project um, and moving forward and what, what you guys do with um, community involvement and just what you guys do in general? Yeah, um, so we started the ARCH project about four years ago. Um, my good friend Nancy and her then boyfriend Nate, um, they both started it. Uh, it was just mainly because the climbing community had started to grow a bit. We started seeing a lot more people at the crags at you know, the different bouldering spots. And we kind of just wanted to make sure that everyone was educated on the ethics, the practices that we have in place. Um, and then also we just wanted to give back to the community. Uh, we wanted them to see us as not, you know, just climbers who leave white chalk on the rocks. You know, we're actually here to make this area cleaner. We're going to maintain it, you know. I feel like it's our job to make sure this place looks nice for the next person to come out here. Well, is there any one specific project that you guys have done or community outreach that you're especially proud of? Yeah, actually, um, there's a church by Waimea Bay. Um, there's some rocks behind it that we had discovered. Um, that area at some point was overtaken by like homeless encampments. So there were like probably two big homeless encampments, so much trash there. So we talked to the church and asked them, hey, you know, we have a group of people. Can we come out there and clean this up for you guys? They said, uh, yeah, sure. So we went and we did that. It took multiple uh, events, but now we have access there. If you go out there and you tell the guys, hey, we're here to go rock climbing, He'll let us park um, in the back, and we just we have access there. So that that was a great thing that we were able to do for the community. That's super cool. That's really nice, and just shows how um, if it's handled correctly, the climbing community and the community in general can actually work together, which is something that's you know difficult in some places. I'm curious to know more about um, the community that you climb with there. Could you just give us a little bit of insight into what it's like um, and, you know, maybe what we could experience if we were able, ever able to come visit? Yeah, um, everyone is so friendly here. I mean, it's still a pretty small community. Um, at one point, we had two climbing gyms. That, was, that lasted about a year and a half, and at the time, both climbing gyms were really busy, so um, there's probably actually a lot more climbers here than I even know, but um, as far as, you know, the outdoor climbing community, that, that group is a lot smaller, so we all kind of know each other, especially the ones that go out bouldering, you know, because we, we all have to share pads and coordinate to make sure that uh, we can have a nice, uh, safe experience together. Um, yeah, we just have, you know, a very diverse group of people. Hawaii is just like that in general. Um, all types of ethnicities, you know, uh, Filipino, Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, uh, Korean. We have um, African Americans. We have Europeans. <laughs> um, we have people from um, the LGB group. Uh, we have a lot of military because we have some military bases here. Um, so it changes a lot here because um, Hawaii is a very transient place. Um, a lot of people just come for a little while and then they move. So I, you know, for me, I get a little bit sad that, you know, our friends leave. But yeah, it's, it's a great community and it's nice to meet all these people. And then they move to the mainland and we can connect again in the mainland. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Everyone's really friendly. That's awesome. 
What do you think the, you know, the, the value in having a, such a diverse community, especially when it comes to climbing is? Um, I think it just makes everyone feel comfortable, really. I mean, we have a good group of girls that come out too. So, you know, you're not feeling so intimidated being the only girl or the only Asian person, you know, there's every, every type of person out there um, trying this and it all brings us together. You know, we have 18 year olds hanging out with 60 year olds and why? Because we all love climbing. We love the outdoors. So, um, yeah. I definitely think that climbing is one of those things that can really help you transcend a lot of differences between people. Um, I know that's something that we've really tried to work on at our climbing tower at UCF is really just creating a more inclusive and uh, diverse place. And so in a, you know, in a university, we have a lot of opportunities to do that because we have a lot of students. But how would you suggest that we continue to make um, our spaces even more diverse and inclusive? Well, I know there's these um, groups that are making um, events for all women or, you know, I think the, uh, maybe the Brown Girls Club or the BBC, they have an event um, that they do in the Southeast. And so I think those, you know, make everyone feel a lot more comfortable being able to see familiar faces and things like that. And, um, and I think that, you know, these climbing companies also need to support all the diverse groups that are out there so that people can see that there are all kinds of people that rock climb. Absolutely. Uh, we've started doing a lot more with some of the groups that I know that you're a part of as well. Um, we've started to rely on a, um, Brown Girls Climbing a lot for some insight because we've started programming um, a women's empowerment um, a couple of Fridays out of the semester. Um, but I know that you've done some blogging with Melanin Basecamp, and I would love to know more about your work with them and what that group means to you. Um, they approached me a few years ago, you know, letting me know that they, they want to diversify the outdoors. It wasn't just climbing. It was um, skydiving, hiking, all types of things. And I thought that was a really great idea, you know, for me. I never even knew people rock climbed until I was in college and, you know, that guy brought that up to me. Um, had I learned about it younger, at an earlier age, in high school, for instance, you know, I, I think I would have jumped on it then. And, um, you know, I think that maybe the high schools and middle schools could um, get the kids more into it at an earlier age so that, you know, you're not getting into it while you're in school trying to do your studies and everything like that. Yeah, maybe there's some outreach that we as a, a climbing community in Florida could do too. Not that we like have a ton big of- brothers, big sisters kind of thing. Yeah, we definitely don't have a ton of access <laughs> in Florida um, to outdoor climbing oh. at least, but- Is there outdoor climbing in Florida? Mm. Not really. <laughs> no, no. I a think... lot of climbing gyms or? We're getting there for sure. Um, yeah, we have, we have a lot of gyms, but Florida's flat as a pancake. Like, <laughs> yeah, climbing is pretty intimidating when you first start off. It's pretty hard, um, and and you really can't muscle into it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think just starting off slow and kind of um, working your way up to it. It's, it's it takes a lot of commitment. To be honest, you know. Um, if you really want to excel at climbing, it, it can't be like a sometimes kind of thing to me. I feel like it's a pretty full-time, um, nonstop, uh, you know, training and trying to make yourself a better climber. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think that probably resonates with a lot of the people on this call, especially <laughs> from the head nods I got. So... Um, in your, your experience, both in climbing, but in life, um, it seems like you've probably had some, some mentors or some leaders that have kind of helped you find that, that dedication and kind of kept you moving. Um, would you be willing to tell us about any of those people? Sure. Um, so I, I first started out rock climbing in uh, South Carolina and we would go to North Carolina a lot. Um, I had a a climbing coach because they had a class called climbing 101 so he kind of um taught us a lot about what we 
we were able to do from um, the leave no trace um, ethics, um, you know, being respectful to other climbers, you know, not staying on one climb the entire day, um, and just continuing to push yourself a little bit harder. You know, if you're not, um, you know, if you're not trying while you're falling, then, you know, you're not trying hard enough. I had people that wouldn't let me down off the rope until they saw that I had really put in that effort which I have now learned that a lot of people don't like that. <laughs> but for me, it was great for me to overcome that. Um, Cause you know, sometimes you fall and you say, Oh, just let me down, let me down. Mm -hmm. I'll try again when I'm fresh, but no, that's not what it's about. It's, you know, sticking it through, jumping back on that move and figuring out that move. And just, even if you fall 10 times, but if you make it to the top, it's amazing. Right. So um, I've also met some other um, climbers here in Hawaii. I met um, Jack Johnson, um, Jeff Johnson from uh, Rock and Ice, and he lives in Maui. He did a lot of developing there, and so he kind of taught me about how to go about, you know, developing a new area, um, maneuvering with the public access, um, with the government, and things like that. So. He educated me a bit about that and how to, you know, get some of the younger people more involved too. So, uh, my question was kind of asking if there was any, um, like, obviously, there's a lot of things and like throughout your climbing career and just life that will build into your leadership and your your approach to climbing and expanding into new areas. But I was wondering if there was any like defining moments or defining like people or like experiences with specific people that kind of got you to where you are today. Huh. Um. I mean, honestly, when I first started climbing, it was just for fun, right? Just to hang out with my friends, be outside. I wasn't really interested in trying to, like, find the hardest grade. Um, but at some point, I don't, I don't know what happened. I just decided, like, hey, you know, there's all these V6s on the island that I've never done. None of these girls have ever done. Like, I should try to do them. And one by one, I started doing them. And I think I started motivating some of the other girls to think like, hey, maybe, you know, she can do it and she's only five two, maybe I can do it. Um and and their uh their, you know, I felt like they believed in me almost more than I believed in myself. And so that kind of kept pushing me to like um maybe go to a V seven and then, you know, try a V eight and a V nine and a V ten and you shouldn't stop yourself from trying something that looks really, really hard. You know, even though maybe you're not at that level yet, it should be something that you want to try just so you know what it feels like, what you're going towards, you know. Um, so that was a big thing to me. Um, I learned how to project um, climbs and not expect to just um, flash it and be done with. It was, it means a lot more once you put in all that work and you're going there every week bugging your friends to come bring some pads out and watch you and and you know once you finally get it it's um it's an amazing feeling it's a little bit sad because now you lost that relationship with this um challenge that you had but at the same time it's really rewarding and you think to yourself like wow what else can i do to try this other one that's really tall and scary things like that i feel so inspired <laughs> I mean, I think that that perseverance is something that we learn a lot in the outdoors, um, both in climbing, but in other specialties. Um, anything that we're doing outside, it requires us to kind of dig in and, and reach a little bit further than maybe we thought we could. Um, Absolutely. You know, I think that's kind of what attracts a lot of us to it. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, for me, it's, I took that to my personal life as well. You know, even just moving to Hawaii. Um, I had no family, no friends. I had just come out here on a trip and loved it and realized that um, maybe I could find a career here. So I, I just literally borrowed a thousand dollars from my brother, packed two suitcases and I was here and I never left. So um, taking that chance, I don't know that I would have done if I'd never been climbing and <clears throat> realized that taking a chance is a great thing, yeah. Um, it's helped me in my career as well. You know, I've taken the chances to switch jobs to this rail project was, that was kind of um, 
an iffy thing to do because it's a temporary project, a temporary position. So I wasn't really sure if that's a good thing. I didn't know anyone who had ever done it before, but I said, hey, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen, right? <laughs> I could probably find another job, but <laughs> it ended up working out really well. So. That sounds like it. Um, I know a lot of the things in my life that have been the greatest things of my life happened because I was willing to take a chance and just and go for it. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of our students need to hear right now, um, especially the seniors that are about to graduate and move into kind of an, an uncertain market. Um, and so what, what would you say to them? What would you say to the seniors that are about to, to go on to their next step? Well, I went straight into working as soon as I graduated. Looking back on it, I'm not sure that I should have. Maybe I should have, you know, spent some time on myself, um, you know, travel a bit, kind of figure out um, what kind of work I want to do. Um, I know, you know, we pick our majors and we're like, oh, well, we're going to be a geologist, but then things change. Maybe there's no jobs for geologists, right? So for me, I had to look and say, okay, what jobs are out there? What what needs are out there? Okay, do they need a lot of nurses? Do they need a lot of environmental? I saw that environmental was really important to me, um, to my heart. And I thought that there was an opportunity for a job too, you know. And being in Hawaii, for me, it felt like, wow, how lucky am I to be able to do all the things I want. I can do environmental work and protect, you know, one of the most beautiful places in the world. Um, you know, think about those types of things. Think about, do you want to work outside? Do you want to work inside? Because um, you can find jobs in both or, you know, a mixture. So um, think about that stuff. Um, take chances, you know, if you get opportunities and it sounds scary and you're moving to a new place and you don't know anyone, why not try it? Try it. You know, I mean, the worst thing that could happen is you go back home to mom and dad, but I'm sure they'll come back. I mean, they'll be happy to have you back. So it's worth it to try it, to try different things. Um, just, I would say try to do something that really inspires you, that, that you want to do, that's not like, oh, God, I have to go to work every day, you know? Absolutely. So I just wanted to, like, have another question that like kind of related to what you were just talking about like as far as students that are going to be graduating and moving to a new place and um the importance of like taking care of your mental health when you move somewhere new so that you don't get overwhelmed uh, how do you you know find new opportunities to uh take care of yourself yeah um, it's really hard when you first move to a new place you don't know anybody it took me probably two years to kind of develop like really good friends that I could count on. Um, I think I, I made the mistake of not joining enough um, clubs and groups and um, other events. Um, I, I think I didn't do that enough. All I did was go to Waimea Bay <laughs> and go climbing there, which, I mean, I did meet some people there, but um, yeah, I would say join more clubs and events and, you know, uh, meet people that, um, that could inspire you, that could probably give you a job maybe, you know. Um, I always think, like, the bigger your network, the better off you are, especially your mental health, right? More people that um, you can help and they can help you back. So. Awesome. That was great. As somebody who recently moved to for a job, um, I certainly – resonate with that. And I think it's really important to just embrace kind of the awkwardness at the beginning of any relationship that you have and just, and just kind of go for it. Um, you yeah. know, the worst that could happen is that you don't see that person again and that's okay. Um, but the best that can happen is a lot more. So I think that's really good advice. I am going to send it to Josh first because I know he asked me a question earlier and I didn't get to it. So Josh, you take it away. It's a super important question. What's your favorite route and why? <laughs> okay um so we had talked a little i think we talked about the arch the the big arch feature um on the no northwest side of the island um you've probably seen pictures of it it's pretty um, amazing just looking at it um once you're there and you you feel the ocean and everything it, it has a lot of mana it has a lot of energy um 
There's this climb there called Big Baby Buddha. It was put up by um, professional rock climber Jason Keel. Um, you guys may have heard of him. So he came out and he put this climb up. And um, that was probably in 2010. Um, and in 20, uh, 2015, uh, my friend Nancy and I started working on it. We, um, we figured out like from the midway point up. And so from then on, we said, okay, well now we got to start from the bottom and go all the way up. And, you know, I thought that was only going to take maybe five or six months to figure out. But given the conditions with, you know, we have when the tides are too high, we weren't able to climb it. Or if it was too rainy and wet, we couldn't climb it. So it ended up taking me two years to do that climb. Um, I actually, I think when I finally did it, I kind of cried from relief because uh, I was just so happy. And um, I, for, there are times that I was just didn't know if I could do it because um it had a lot of burly moves, like kind of manly moves, and I wasn't sure that I had the wingspan. Um, but, you know, we just worked on it for those two years, and I tweaked my beta, changing little foot moves or hand moves, and, you know, I finally got it, and when I did, uh, it felt so good, but it was actually a breaking point. Once I got that, um, I sent a B9 um, at the arch, four months later, and I sent, like, another V8, like, two months later, it's just, I don't know, I guess it's, like, once you get that in your mind that you're capable, um, it really, it just, I don't know, it's, like, your body follows through with it, okay. and finding your way at doing it, Jason Keel definitely didn't do all the heel hooks and knee bars that I did, he probably didn't need to, but I did, <laughs> and it worked. Yeah. And you did it. I dropped the YouTube link to you climbing it in the chat. Um, so sorry, I didn't ask you first, but um, no, awesome. If anybody wants to check it out, it's pretty awesome. Patrick and I watched it before your interview, and we were like, "Oh my god, she's so crazy!" <laughs> um, so it's really amazing. Definitely suggest you guys check it out. Good question, hey. Josh. So I was wondering what was, what's been your favorite part about the climbing community and how has it influenced you? Um, the best part about the, about the climbing community here in Hawaii is it's really growing and developing here. And so I feel like I have the ability to kind of educate them from the things that, you know, I learned from North Carolina, um, a place that has a lot more history there. Um, they have their regulations with their government, you know, in place pretty well. And um, I, I use them as a, as a template of where Hawaii wants to be in the future. I know climbing areas um, in Boone, for instance, um, they will never have a guidebook, I don't think, because they, they, um, they cherish their climbing areas and they're, they're concerned that if, you know, they build a guidebook, it'll be like some of the other really popular places. And, you know, sometimes people aren't doing the right things, you know, they're not parking where they need to park, they're leaving trash behind or stashing pads, you know, all these things you might think is okay. Um, but when you have a huge community of people doing that, it's not okay. So I think that I'm lucky to be able to um, educate our developing group here. How's the community there in um, Florida? Is it a small group or? I'll kick that answer over to Josh. I've only been here in Florida for less than a year, but Josh has been climbing here for a long time. So if you want to take that away, Josh. I would say it's kind of surprisingly large, actually. Um, usually in the big cities, there's a lot of climbing gyms. Um, I know we have one in Orlando that's super popular, and there's some in Miami, some in Tampa, St. Petersburg. Um, just some of the big area, like cities in the area. So since we don't have climbing in Florida, uh, people still want to climb as much as they can. So the gym communities are a really, really big deal. Um, there's a lot of clubs that spring out of that, a lot of kids groups, a lot of teams, uh, a lot of just hobbyists that do that. And that's often the introduction for a lot of people to, you know, travel around the country or outside of the country to go climbing. So it's kind of, um, I like to think of Florida as kind of a springboard for climbers, uh, but it's really hard to cultivate like an outdoor climbing skill and um, awareness here. Though there is an awful lot of people that are interested and an awful lot of people that are actually climbing. So you guys yeah. do have um, groups that you take out climbing to other states? 
And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm actually president of the climbing club at UCF, and it amazes me like how many people there are now in the collegiate team. Like it's just it's grown so much in the last couple of years. Um, and what we try to we try to do at least twice a year is we take a group of like. It, in the past, even even as the trips have grown, in the past is like 12 people. Our last trip, I think, was 24 people. Um, so wow. we'll take a group of people and go to another state usually and try to climb outdoors. Um, Where have yeah, you guys gone? We've gone, my favorite place that we've gone was the Red in Kentucky, um, Red River Gorge. And we went to, last trip we went to that I led was Rumbling Bald um, in North Carolina. Yeah, um, that's where I learned to climb rumbling bald. It's amazing. Really, it bouldering, was, it was so much bouldering fun. and sport climbing is great there. Yeah, did we, you guys we do both. Did bouldering. Yeah, we did. We just did bouldering. Um, but because we usually do like either bouldering or a sport trip, we don't usually do both. Um, we've gone to um, Horse Fun Forty, uh, a couple other places too. But yeah, it's always super fun. People, people love. Like most people going on the trip have never climbed outdoors before. So it's really fun bringing people outdoors for the first time. They're like, this is so different. This is so hard. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very really fun. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. And you guys can teach them how to spot and where to put the pads right. and anything like yeah. that. Yeah. It's a lot of safety training. And like, we always try to, again, like enforce the clean up after yourself, pick up trash that's not yours. Yeah. All of that. Awesome. That's great. You guys are doing that. It's hard when you first come out. It's not the same, right? Um, at the gym, maybe everyone's just sitting around watching you climb. When you're outside, you guys better be up there spotting each other, you know, yeah. <laughs> and communicating. So, that's, yeah, it's, it's hard when you first go out and you just don't know. It's not that they are intentionally doing anything wrong. Maybe they left some tick marks behind, you know, but that's where people like us can um, remind them that, hey, you know, you don't have to give them a big talk. You can just brush it off and let them know just by example. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's super important. And then you can build the community from there and then they can teach other people and the community as a whole just gets stronger. That's the best. And I mean, back to access. I mean, the best way to manage ourselves is to manage ourselves. We don't want them telling us what we can and can't do. So, you know, um, I know certain areas when there's nobody there, you know, we'll have um, maybe a speaker with some music playing. If we're in an area with a lot of people, definitely not a cool thing to do, right? Yeah. Um, I think Miguel had a question next. So if you want to take that away. Yeah. So coming in more from an environmental standpoint, which is a bit more of my passion, I had a question of how has like maybe something like climate change or specifically affected climbing? And if there are any like specific or special considerations that can be taken aside from uh, leave no trace um, to to make sure that we still protect um, these habitats. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, in Hawaii, it's not so much of a big deal about um, climbing after it rains. But if you go to other areas um, made of sandstone, like red rocks, um, or if you go to um, Stony Point in California, those places are very sensitive. Um, if you climb within 24 to 48 hours of rain, then that rock will break. So you're ruining it for everyone else in the future. Um, climate change has definitely made the, the weather patterns very different. You know, I mean, we had those crazy fires in um, California, Australia recently had it. Um, I think it's also causing us to have these crazy rainstorms as well, you know, and, and people just need to be mindful that if you're climbing on sandstone and it has rained, it, it would be a good idea to talk to some of the locals um, before you go out climbing, especially if you're going to like place gear and stuff like that. So that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, are there also any considerations when, when setting up new routes or like exploring for new route options? Um, not so much with climate change, but for me, I, I think more about like the cultural historical aspect mm -hmm. of the area. A lot of the climbing places we like are also um, really historical and sensitive to the native people. Um, I just came back from 
the Grampians in Australia. And I don't know if you guys know, but a large a portion of their area closed down recently because of cultural um, sensitivity. And so, you know, that there again, you know, if we're not being respectful of those places, um, they would just close all of it off from us, so. Thank you. Arguably they should, right? You know, if we're, we can't yeah. respect it, then we don't deserve to be on it, so. Um, Very that true. Was, that was great, thank you. Um, Chris, it looks like you have a question as well. What, um, what is in your opinion, like the situation going on for the sport climbing, like just in general, like how do you think the climbs are there for there? In Hawaii? Yes. Um, so um, Mokalei'ia on Oahu, um, the climbing there is a little weird, um, to be honest. When I first got there, they had this string set up on every route, and I was like, what is this thing? But what they did is they bring it up so that you can set up a top rope um, line up um, for every climb. So even though to me it's weird, and in North Carolina the epic was you go from the ground up, you know, you never just throw a top rope up like that, but um, it's actually given us an opportunity to train and work on really hard climbs that, you know, otherwise we wouldn't be able to do on sport. So that's been good, but the, the climbing at Mokalia is a lot of stemming and um, like chimney type climbing. Um, sometimes there's like no holds at all. It's just you pressing it against the wall. It's kind of cool though um, to get all contorted like that. Um, but then in Maui, there's a really popular place called Sunny Kiave. Uh, we call it PKs. Um, and that, that wall is a little bit small. It's probably like only 35, 40 feet. But they have these really cool, like, bulby um, features that, you know, you can just um, maneuver around. They're just really cool, bouldery type climbs. So I really liked it because you can do things like heel hooking and just different techniques that um, I never do at Mokalia. Mokalia is all just pressing. And so, yeah, it's, it's pretty different. Um, but definitely try. Um, Try both. Um, definitely Maui and Oahu have the most um, climbing like developed. So my question was, um, for me, uh, uh, mentality uh, plays a large part into like how well you perform on a certain route. So for you, um, what kind of mentality do you have when you're approaching certain types of climbs, whether it's like bouldering, top roping, how like, what, what, do, you, what do you keep in your mind to really give yourself the best kind of performance? I always tell myself I can do this, okay? Um, I try to picture myself doing all the moves. I mean, even if I've never done it before, um, I feel like I have to think that way because there's definitely been times where I get really nervous and scared and, you know, I start to doubt myself. And I've even read that, you know, doing that, um, your body has less oxygen moving through it. So you actually perform worse because you're restricting yourself of um, oxygen, basically. So it's really important to just stay calm, you know, look at what you're doing, try not to rush through it, and do the best you can, you know, give it your all every single time. And yeah, definitely mentally picture yourself doing it. I think that really helps. I feel like you got to do that with a job interview too, you know. You just got to go in there, like, you got this, you own it. I mean, don't be too um, aggressive, right? People don't like that. But just knowing that you're capable, that you can learn whatever they're throwing at you. Man, you've got all kinds of advice for these kids. Love it. Thank you. I love this opportunity, by the way. Thank you guys for reaching out to me. I feel really honored that you guys would even ask me. <laughs> To talk to you guys about these things but um, it really means a lot to me um, climbing access um, you know future generations and sustainability is really really important to me so thank you very much yeah absolutely when we were um, looking for people to host these interviews with us we were looking for people that have made a big impact on their community and for people that you know love the outdoors but also love different parts of it so we immediately saw like you you had made a name for yourself in 
um, diversity and inclusion in the outdoors and with sustainability in the outdoors as well. And so this is absolutely Yay. something that we have wanted to bring to our program and want to make better. So you are a perfect person that we could talk to and get this information to our program. Ah, so honored. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we are super thankful for you. Um, also super thankful for all of you guys for coming to our first campfire chat. Um, this is going to be basically the wrap up of it. Uh, we've been here for about an hour and we've learned so many good things. So thank you again um, for just instilling your knowledge in all of our lives. Um, I know I'll certainly take some of the things that you said today and apply them hopefully immediately. Um, but if you guys enjoyed this and you want to come and hear some more great conversations, we're going to be doing this every Sunday. So just be on the lookout for that. Um, it won't always be with our wonderful guest today, um, but she's always welcome to join if you want to. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, so I definitely am appreciative of all of you guys, and I can't wait to see you soon. Thank you again. We appreciate uh -huh. you. Aloha. Yay. <laughs>